Our first keynote speaker joining us today has cemented her influence as a techno-feminist artist, researcher, and educator by both anticipating and creating from a space that recognizes the growing necessity for alternative economic models within digital culture and communities. As a result of her research dealing with themes such as collective ownership, self-governance and in artistic infrastructures, as well as her work such as Net Art Generator, which is an art generating, al art producing algorithm, and Female Extension, her famous hack of the first competition for internet art, she's considered a pioneer of digital and internet art. Today, she will not only discuss with, her, with us her ongoing work within various fields, but she also wanted to take this time to use this as a platform to highlight other examples or projects worldwide that are currently producing digital comments and with intelligent and forward-thinking infrastructures, thereby providing alternative examples as to how non-hierarchical systems can effectively self-organize through an open and public exchange of information and art. A lot of what we're doing here. So sharing with us, today, her thoughts, observations, musings regarding the future of communities, as well as joining us for a live Q&A session immediately afterwards, I would like to welcome Dr. Cornelia Solfrank to Creative Days Vienna 2021. Thank you so much, Cornelia. Thanks, Adia, for this fabulous uh, introduction. Oh, I have an echo now in my sound. OK, now it's gone. OK, great. Uh, again, Adia, thanks a lot for this uh, fabulous introduction and good afternoon, everyone. Everyone on site there in Vienna, but also online. Um, as has been said already, this year's Creative Days have chosen four main topics and I decided to engage with the first one, the future communities. I take this talk as an opportunity to revisit concepts of community, which means to look a bit into theory, but also to visit actual communities which provide interesting food for thought through their practice. I have selected three different projects that I have explored within a recent research project, but before introducing them to you, I would like to begin with some general reflections and maybe we can also have the PowerPoint presentation coming in soon. Thank you. Um, yeah, you can go to the next slide already. Thank you. Um, when I think of community, I either think of something small or, and local or of an online community, such as a special interest group online, Facebook groups and the like. Also, I do not consider myself as a typical community person. I have to admit that there is this very deep desire to be part of a community, to belong to an identifiable group. At the same time, this is exactly what gives me horrors. In order to be accepted within the community, I have to obey to certain rules and standards, which immediately makes me feel unfree. To say the least, I am ambivalent when it comes to the idea of community. Also, because I know that all struggles against oppression for the idea of equality and a classless society are a joint project, a project of collaboration and solidarity. So rethinking the idea of community is something that has been driving my own work for a long time. It is a question of getting Order organized instead of being organized, uh, getting organized in a self-designed structure without being forced into constricting patterns of behavior and thinking. One of my own projects I have been involved with in the late 1990s was the Old Boys Network, the first international cyber feminist alliance, an organization in which the idea of dissent played a crucial role in defying our modus operandi. In any case, a challenging project, which we managed to navigate for five years through the contradictions of agreement and disagreement, of collabora collaboration and competition, of successes and failures. This project alone would be a full-length topic but for today I would like to dedicate our time together to different projects and their modes of community. 
In his book, The Inoperative Community, French philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy distinguishes between two sorts of communities. A forced community, which he describes as closed, identitarian, and immanent. It is about producing identity through the demarcation of what belongs to it and what does not. The endeavor is to realize what has already been set as its entity. In contrast to that, he sets a community that is not close, but rather substantially open. The inoperative community is non-essentialist and based on a subjectless community of singularities. It is a community that experiences itself at its fringes and subjectiv subjectivity does not mean a complete subject. To quote from this book, the community is neither a work to be produced nor a lost communion, but rather a space itself and the spacing of the experience of the outside, of the outside of self, end of quote. Such community is looking ahead, making the singular experience in its encounters to the basis of its politics. I would like to understand this little theoretical introduction or excursion um, as a way to discuss our projects and with it the idea to free the notion of community from the association with a repressive forced unity and instead think of it as, a, as related to choice, to freedom, to responsibility and pleasure while not losing sight of the underlying politics. A transformation based on collaboration, on sharing, on mutual support and the related values which necessarily means a transformation of economy to more sub sustainability, to collective forms of production and life in general. So with that, uh, we go to the next slide, please. Uh, I come to the three projects uh, I would like to introduce to you. So the three projects um, are Monoscope, Furtherfield and Ms. Balthasar's lab. And I have explored them in more detail within our recent research project, Creating Commons. It was based at the University of the Arts in Zurich and went from 2017 to 2020. And there we conducted the research together with my colleagues Felix Stalder from Vienna and Shusha Niederberger. During our research, we explored projects initiated and run by artists who produce or maintain digital comments. The artistic projects discussed are of a highly heterogeneous sort, but they all share certain aspects in common. Some of them, for example, provide access to resources, often by building technical infrastructures or by organizing settings for informal knowledge transfer. They take care of specific cultural goods and make sure these goods remain widely accessible. Others are more focused on creating social formations, whether in the form of physical lo locations where people can gather and do something together, or in the form of technical infrastructures, such as platforms, servers, or websites, which facilitate communication outside the logic of surveillance capitalism, enable access to certain resources, or allow networking to take place on the basis of common interests and shared values. In each case, the primary concern of the respective projects is to establish connections and relations and thus create human and more than human socialities. We use the idea of the commons as a conceptual framework to instigate a discussion about understanding cultural goods beyond the paradigm of intellectual property and ownership and rather see them as a common good that should be taken care of by a community on their own terms of use. The structural definition suggested by Massimo de Angelis and Stavros, Stavros Stavridis 
we found very useful as it allows for comparability beyond cultural specificities, beyond the nature of the respective resources and also beyond particular ethical values. The next slide, please. Thank you. In their text on the comments from 2011, uh, the theoreticians elaborate the following three-part definition of the commons. In order to constitute the uh, commons, there needs to be first a pool of resources, goods, tangible or intangible, rival or non-rival. Secondly, a community of people who create and sust sustain the resources, which is the commoners. And thirdly, the social process that creates and reproduces the commons. That means people taking things into their own hands, negotiating, creating rules, which means to common or commoning. The verb to common has been suggested by historian Peter Limbo, and he describes commoning as the social practice of constant negotiation of the terms and conditions of the use of the respect respective resources. So this definition allows to distinguish between goods, people, and the social relations, and to understand them at the same time as integral, integral parts of the commons as a social institution. Of course, this distinction do not apply to all commons equally, but the advantage of this three-part definition is that it provides various entry points into a research field in which economic, political, philosophical and social issues overlap in complex ways and in our research area aesthetic considerations additional come into play. Without theoretically determining what constitutes commons, this structural definition provides a useful framework because it leaves space for specific approaches from the various involved disciplines and it particularly also encourages the study of existing projects and thus the alignment of theory and practice which is exactly what we have doing have been doing in our research project and why this field of study the digital commons would be nothing unusual within the context of technology and related social studies, focusing on such projects within the art field was rather special. Firstly, because it poses the question if what these artists are doing can still, con uh, con can still be considered as art. And secondly, if there is anything they can add to the digital commons that is specific to art. The questions that framed our research were the following. How can new forms of organization and collaboration bring forth different kinds of cultural works and social relations? How are new property relations articulated? How can artistic practices contribute to the further development of the commons as inclusive, diverse and democratic forms of organization? What role can art and an expanding understanding of aesthetics play in the advancement of the commons as a political project? Next slide, please. We think of these urgent questions because commons constitute constantly evolving realities pointing beyond the growing commercialization of culture and its damaging effects. We have concluded our research with a publication that came out in January this year. It has been published as open access, so please download it and check it out. We certainly did not answer all the questions that we, we, that we pose, but the 10 texts provide a theoretical framework for this new field, which is with, with its complex practices and the dense discourses. So, with that, I would like to start with the three projects that I have announced. Let's go to the first project with the next slide, please. 
So the first project I would like to introduce to you is Monoscorp. It is an online project, a wiki and a WordPress blog founded in 2004. It is a repository aggregating, documenting and mapping cultural works, artists and initiatives related to the avant-garde, to media arts, to theory and activism. It provides both an exhaustive indexical overview of these fields and also digital access to rare historic finds. Initially, it focused on Eastern and Central Europe. That is also where it originated in Bratislava in Slovakia. Its spiritus rector and movens is artist Dujan Barok, who has built the wiki and maintains the site. It is easy to get editor rights and to contribute. So if you go to the site and find something missing, you are welcome to add to the archive yourself. Currently, the project has around 6,000 active participants from all over the world. Over time, the archive expanded from linking and contextualizing information to also host relevant files such as books, texts, documents, and media files, and thus became a publishing initiative in its own right. Due to its constant growth, Monoscope has transformed from a special interest archive to become a significant cultural resource. Today, the wiki comprises of 7,017 content pages and 16,615 documents. In parallel to the wiki, Monoscope maintains a blog repository featuring daily releases of books, journals, and other printed archival material, some freshly digitized by Monoscope and some contributed by the users, the authors of these texts, or the publishers. Increasingly, Monoscope also triggers offline events frequently with cultural institutions, that have come to appreciate the unique resource of this autonomous archive. Monoscope is but one of the so-called pirate libraries in the art context, others being ubu.com, arc.fail or memory of the world that are all run by artists while having different foci and terms of use and participation and with that different communities that create and support them. The Amsterdam-based media scholar Bodo Balas indicated that these sorts of libraries and collections could be considered to be the practical manifestation of Aaron Swartz's Guerrilla Open Access Manifesto. In this manifesto, the American hacker and activist pointed out the flaws of open access politics and aimed at recruiting supporters for the idea of radical open access. Radical in this context means to completely ignore copyright and simply make as much information available as, po as possible. Next slide, please. Basically, it addresses the what he calls privileged in the sense that they do have access to information as academic staff or librarians, and he calls on their support for building a system of freely available information by using their privilege, downloading and making available information. To quote from this manifesto, we need to take information wherever it is stored, make our copies and share them with the world. We need to take stuff that's out of copyright and add it to the archive. We need to buy secret databases and put them on the web. We need to download scientific journals and upload them to file sharing networks. We need to fight for guerrilla open access. With enough of us around the world, we'll not just send a strong message opposing the privatization of knowledge, we'll make it a thing of the past. Will you join us? So, end of the quote. Let's go to the next slide then. So embedded uh, in this ecosystem of open access is also IC uh, Monoscope. 
and um, we were able to do an interview with Dushan Barak during our research project. And in this interview, Dushan explains how the project Monoscope originated in Bratislava in early 2000s as an attempt to collect and publish information on Eastern European experimental media arts, which at the time certainly was not part of the canon. Embedded in the context of Burundi, a local artist initiative in Bratislava, Monoscope um, started to gather and exchange information on people, on initiatives, on projects, on publication and events within a non-Western context and eventually grew into a large resource mapping arts and humanities. So, and uh, I put the link also here uh, any material that I'm referencing in the context of Creating Commons, you can find on our website, creatingcommons.zhdk.ch, uh, also link to the interviews. I, I really would like to invite you to, to check them out and to experience uh, these people also in person. So with that, I would like to go to the next project and to the next slide, please. The next project is Furtherfield in London. Furtherfield is an artist-led organization and community platform located in North London. It was founded in 1996 by Ruth Catlow and Mark Garrett and features a broad range of activities in art, technology and media. Next slide um, is the self-description uh, or further field, it says further field connects people to new ideas, critical thinking, and imaginative possibilities for art technology and the world around us. Through artworks, labs, and debate, people from all walks of life explore today's important questions. Next slide, please. Further field consists of two venues in a park called Finsbury Park. Um, one is the Furtherfield Gallery, which you can see here, and the other is uh, the next slide, Furtherfield Common Space, a media lab, but they also run an online platform, furtherfield.org, including the mailing list Net Behavior and Networked Artists Community. Its program includes exhibitions, workshops, and a variety of events, both offline and online. Amazingly, they celebrate the 25th anniversary this year, which is noteworthy because it is an organization that has been built mainly with enthusiasm and conviction. They call it self-funded, which means they put money they earned elsewhere in building the organization. And it was not until 2005 that the Arts Council acknowledged their work and started to fund core infrastructure and gave a contribution to rent and minor wages. Next slide, please. In the interview I did with them, um, with Mark and Ruth, in the context of creating comments, they explained how the art world in the UK was taken over in the mid-90s by the spirit of the YBA bubble, the young British artists, and with that the spirit of commercialization became predominant. Many artists who had critically engaged with politics and who were searching for a more emancipatory role for art in society, felt suspended and were lacking a context, not to say a platform where they could meet and get organized. In our conversation, Ruth and Mark look back on how they started from an online community and grew into a multi-dimensional space for different practices in and through technologies, art and culture. They highlight the importance of communities and public space and how they reflect their concerns in their curatorial practice in today's technopolitical situation. They explain how Furtherfield is working as a community-driven institution, how formats and subjects are developed, 
how they position themselves in the cultural landscape and how they manage to get funding. Alongside these insights into the inner life of the organization, they provide a detailed discussion about the importance of data as comments, how this discussion is related to historical events, and what an informed critical mindset could achieve for the future of all of us. It, this was the motivation behind starting further field to give space for experimental and critical art that also try to explore new forms of art while leaving classical aesthetic paradigms behind. The other focus of their work is on new technologies which they wanted to explore for their potential of building independent spaces, even within the field of tech itself. So Furtherfield's mission was to create a space for collaborative practices, for digital experimentation, for a critical discourse in art and technology, and to connect as many and as diverse people as possible. Next slide, please. What was helpful for this latter mission is their physical location in the park. As one of the few remaining public spaces in London, Finsbury Park sees about 55,000 visitors in average per week. And there are 180 different languages spoken in the park, which enabled them to connect the art community of the gallery to the local community of the park which they all, which they call the platforming of the park. They are running programs that not only try to include diverse people, but also are actually built on the interests and suggestions of the people using the park. But this is just one aspect. Furtherfield is similarly engaged in the tech community, community and critically deals with ever new emerging technologies with the aim to translate technology by creating engagement with people to make the hidden aspects of technology that are usually not talked about perceivable. For example, they have done long before the hype research on blockchain technology, organized events and published books on the matter, also out of their own interest in creating alternatives to the current finance system. 25 years is a long time and there is no space here to list all the many exhibitions they have put up, the large number of events they have organized, the publications they have made. But apart from all these impressive and countable outcomes, I think what is even more relevant is what they have managed to create between people at the end between people and technology. At the heart of everything they have been do of everything they have been doing is a concern for exchange and community, and they are incorporating this concern in everything they do, which means social relations are what they are made of. And in order for this to happen, it takes space, spaces online and offline, based on infrastructures for resistance. In their understanding, resistance means resistance to predominant commercial rules of the art world and instead building their own art community based on the values of its members and thus enabling to shape the world together. One of their core ideas is the decentralization of knowledge, the acknowledgement that people in different life situations have different forms of experiences and thus different forms of knowledge, and that these should be treated as equally relevant. This concept has been formulated by Donna Haraway, who called it situated knowledges in the context of a feminist critique of science and technology and the illusion of scientific objectivity. Her concept of situated knowledges can be regarded as a feminist epistemology that recognizes its own contingent and localized foundations, as well as the contingent and localized foundations of other forms of knowledge. 
putting such principle at the core of their work, further field expand the variety of people who usually belong to an art community, thus not only allowing access for groups who usually have no access to art, but by doing so, enriching the community through, through connecting diverse knowledges. Furtherfield keeps on asking critical questions about art and technology, addressing today's important questions, and I cannot say how much I admire their work and hope they will be able to continue as long as possible. With that, I would like to go to the third project and the next slide, please. It is a project based in Vienna, and I thought it's of particular interest to give visibility also to the initiatives from the local digital, maybe underground, um, within the creative days. Ms. Balthasar's laboratory is a trans-feminist collective of artists and researchers and was founded in 2008 and is running a space with various activities. And I quote from their website, Ms. Balthasar's laboratory is creating communities, that it, it says there. The collective itself, who started Ms. Balthasar's, uh, consists of six people, but there is a large community of associated members and collaborators. And it is one instance in a growing network of queer feminist hack spaces that have been created as an alternative to traditional hacker spaces and hacker clubs. So it is both, it is a spatial practice, but also the effort to give space to a special practice. Ms. Balthasar's activities comprise of workshops, gatherings, talks, lectures, and the lab also hosts a reading group and organizes joint activities in the field of art technology and feminist practice. As a hack space, it addresses trans and non-binary people, but it also runs a gallery space with a feminist exhibition program. So we have to go forward again with the slides. We went back to further field. Um, the lab is conceived as a safer space. Sorry, oh, that was my mistake. We didn't go back. <laughs> the lab is conceived as a safer space for people who have traditionally been excluded from or have felt unsafe in spaces where science is taught and technology is developed. It invites those people to participate or give workshops that bring together technology, art, and have a critical understanding of gender and techno politics. Within our research project, Creating Commons, we did also an interview with the founding members, Stephanie Wuschitz and Patricia Reis, in which they introduced feminist hacking as an artistic methodology. They discuss the relationship, um, and we can also, we have a slide for that. They discuss the relationship between gender and technology and explain how Ms. Balthasar's lab aims at developing other imaginations of technology by consciously developing a community. They discuss the role of the space in developing that community and the importance of creating a safer space. Both fostering engagement with the community and for the space, but also for reaching out to a wider audience. And next space, these are just some examples of what's happening there. And next again. And another one, please. The scene of queer feminist hack spaces is the working field of the Canadian ethnographer and hacker Sophie Tupin, who has done extended research on it. So this slide shows uh, the interview with uh, Stefanie and Patricia, and then we can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, uh, Sophie Tupin, I would like to introduce um, she describes feminist hacking as a dual expansion, 
not to call it a double hack. And the text I'm referring to is part of this book, which I kind of put into the presentation as well. It's another book that I have been published that I have uh, published a while ago, two two years ago, almost now, called "The Beautiful Warriors: Techno Feminist Practice in the 21st Century," and it contains text by Christina Gramatikopoulou, Isabel de Zena, Femin, Femke Snelting, Spider Alex, Sophie Tupin, and uh, Havale Bale, and also. Yvonne Falkert, and I just wanted to mention this book. For, I, I will not go deeper into it, but some of the references I'm using today also stem from this book and the text inside. It's also open access and you can download it at the website of Minor Compositions if you're interested. So let's go on to the next slide, please. Yep, it's a uh, Sophie Tupin's text called Feminist Hacking, Resistance Through Spatiality. And she describes feminist hacking as a dual expansion, not to call it a double hack. On the one hand, it adds a material dimension to traditional techno-feminism. And on the other hand, it expands the concept of hacking, which typically refers to technical categories such as software and hardware to include gender as an area of application. This movement is made possible by understanding gender as technology. Gender is not thought of as something biologically given, but rather as something that is always being renewed by the heterogeneous cultural processes that make it mutable. Proceeding from formational cultural techniques makes it possible to steer conditions toward the production of the conditions in question, that is, toward the processes that lead to their production. The basis for this is an understanding of sex as technology, an understanding that Teresa de Lauretis, inspired by Michel Foucault, transferred to, tran, uh, transferred to as technology of gender in the mid-1980s, and thus contributed in an essential manner to freeing gender from the binary conception of sexual difference, replacing difference with heterogeneity and replacing naturally given bodies with complex political strategies for naturalization. It is an understanding of gender and the human body as technology, according to Tupin, that makes the praxis of hacking much more accessible because for feminists, this is a more familiar point of entry. So what is essential is that feminist hacking entails a combination of technical competence, feminist principle, and socio-political engagement. Here, unlike the case in traditional hacker environments, technical competence is not something pursued for its own sake or for the sake of recognition within the meritocratic hierarchies of the hacker culture but is rather a necessary precondition for promoting emancipatory aspects when developing or dealing with technology. Prominent feminist principles of the new hacker culture include collectivity in the form of common action, informal and formal transfer of knowledge on the basis of feminist pedagogy, and the production of visibility and not in the sense of individual or collective positions, but rather in the sense of exposing hidden mechanisms of the technological rearm of the off spaces that are never in the picture and yet are constitutive for what is seen. Such things include the physical, economic and material structures in which technologies are embedded. The foundation of this emancipatory and oppositional culture is a redefinition of the relation between on and offline spaces, which is in turn based on the production of its own spaces and structures. So Ms. Paltasas belongs to this international network of queer feminist hack spaces for which the question of inclusion and exclusion plays a central role. How they define and address their target group is a bit different for each space. For Ms. Baltasar, for example, it says, 
we are open and available to women, trans and non-binary people. A very important tool for many communities is the so-called code of conduct, a set of rules of behavior that a community agrees upon. These documents acknowledge the possibility of harassment and provide guidelines for the course of action in case an incident would occur. Codes of conduct have become default practice in free Libre and open source communities worldwide, including the events held in that context, to the point that nowadays it would be hard to find a project without one in place. The existence of such a code of conduct, uh, conduct allows to define inclusion and exclusion in a community, not just through identity, but mainly through behavior. And with that, we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, there's a reference um, to another text in the book, The Beautiful Warriors. It's a text by Femke Snelting. She has long been involved um, in the context uh, Libre Graphics, where she was part of the group that developed the Code of Conduct. And in her text, uh, Codes of Conduct, Transforming Shared Values into Daily Practice, she describes uh, this, this process of creating Code of Conduct. So I think it has become obvious how important and groundbreaking such spaces and their community building are for developing a new and critical approach to technology. This raises the question how they come into being and how they can become part of a sustainable alternative infrastructure. Ms. Balthasar's rely on the community itself through crowdfunding but the major part of their funding comes from public money, which also implies there is a dependency on the political climate. When the right-wing party took over the government in the district a few years back, all funding, for example, for workshops and educational formats has been cut. In the meantime, they developed cross-financing models through working in related research projects, and jobs that allow for continuous operation. But without unpaid labor, these projects could not exist, which is also what puts them at risk. An adequate structural funding would be necessary, not just to continue the daily business, but also for documenting the valuable work they are doing and preserving the knowledge they are producing. So to conclude, um, I would like to think a bit about the various forms of community that these projects produce. In the case of Monoscope, it's an online community. It is the people who use the platform and contribute to it. As we have heard, it's a large number of people and it's very unlikely that they know each other. Nevertheless, I consider this project to be more than just utilitarian. It is about more than just downloading documents or sharing them. While this functionality also exists, Monoscope is more than an anonymous technical infrastructure. It has a face. There's a person who stands for the platform. And most importantly, this person contextualizes the project in the context of pirate libraries, in the context of radical open access politics, and thus makes Monoscope also a discursive project. As such, it addresses issues related to the growing commercial exploitation of information and knowledge and supports its claims with a platform that practices a critique by providing a performatively working alternative. It is its commitment to clearly express values that people connect to and thus become part of the community. The community of further field, however, is a different one. First of all, it is a hybrid between online and offline. Through its online activities, further field has a wide outreach and includes people from all over the world, mainly those interested in their experimental digital art program and their critical discourse on technology. Moreover, Furtherfield's research and publication activities have ensured 
that they have a name in the academic community as well. At the same time, Furtherfield has a strong physical presence, as we have seen, through the gallery in the park and the commons lab. These physical spaces and the activities that take place there create another community that may, to a certain degree, overlap with the online community, but it also manages to include people who would otherwise never get in touch with art, not to speak of critical tech discourse. And I think this is what makes Furtherfield and its community really special. Born out of a critique of the art world and its mechanisms of exclusion, they started to experiment with the use of digital technology for the creation of alternative spaces. While doing so, they did not get lost in the digital space of nowhere, but managed to keep in mind the people around them, their neighbors in the park, with their different backgrounds and experiences, accomplishing the feat of connecting abstract, cultural, technological, and political issues with the lives of the local people. And also, this community is very different from Monoscope. What they do have in common is that also for Furtherfield, their founders, Root and Mark play an important role as identification figures for the community. For more than 25 years, they have been working and fighting for what they believe in, thus becoming important anchors for the layered and diverse community they are embedded in. Last but not least, I would like to have a look at Ms. Bartalsars and their community. Of course, there are many parallels to further field, the local activities, the mix between art and educational formats and tech, the physical space that plays an essential role in configuring the community simply as the diverse group of people who come to the space and do something there together with others. But as this spatial practice has a very specific agenda, it is dedicated to overcoming gender stereotypes in tech, Ms. Balthasar's automatically becomes an important part in the international community of queer feminist hack labs. And it's exactly this combination of a specific value-oriented practice translated into a concrete project, be it an online repository, as in the case of Monoscope, a platformed park as further field, or a space for hacking gender and technology, it's exactly this that constitutes new communities whose significance goes far beyond the very project due to their discursive and symbolic value. So thanks a lot for listening and um, your interest in these projects. And I'm looking forward to a discussion and to get your questions. Hey. Great. Actually, I'm happy that you're looking forward to questions because we've gotten a couple. And, and thank you actually for, for your keynote. Thank you for all of the issues that you've brought up, the things that you've elaborated, the different spaces that you've outlined. I know that yeah, there's definitely a lot of people who are probably thinking of a lot of questions that they're going to add as well. So I'm <laughs> going to start with the first ones. The first question I have is asking if you can elaborate a bit on the role of archives in community formation, stability, mm. and identity. Like, what's the, I guess, the importance? What, why, how, what is the role? <laughs> wow, this is... Uh... This is a very interesting question because one of the projects I'm working on myself at the moment is an archive project. I mentioned in my introduction that in the 90s um, I was part of this organization, Old Boys Network, First Cyber Feminist Alliance, and we, I think we did a lot of groundbreaking research and a lot of experimentation. And, um, when we ended uh, after five years, I mean, everyone kept their own kept their own material. The website is still there, but uh, as th there is a growing interest in this field of, of uh, techno feminism and also an interest in, in cyber feminism, uh, it, it became clear that there is a lack of accessibility to to what we have actually done. You know, the material which is available at the moment is simply 
not enough, is not comprehensive to get to get an idea of what the practice was, of of what the spirit was. So I am working on an archive at the moment, and I'm realizing I have been realizing over the last weeks and months that uh, that I'm that I know nothing about archives <laughs> because this is a very a very special uh, field with a lot of experts and expertise. I was lucky enough to to have um, some people in my in my communities and in my network that are experienced with networks among them Dushan Barak for example from Monoscope so um, we had some interest in, uh, interesting discussions going on I got a lot of good advice but generally speaking I think um, archives are and archives have, first of all archives have a lot to do with the canon you know, that's also something I mentioned in relation to Monoscope, for example. Dujan started Monoscope when he realized that what he's doing, what his context is doing, what he's interested in, is not represented in any official canon. So he started to build his own repository and archive and collect basically what is around him and what he's interested in. So archives have a lot to do with the canon, with the power of writing history, of being written into history, of or being written out of history. And this, of course, is not so much the problem of, of the people who are part of the canon, but more or the practices that are not part of the canon, as, for example, a networking, an artistic networking project in the 90s was not part of any art historical canon. So it would basically, it's not being written into the history and and would be lost if there would not be a, a new uh, interest and work in building the archive. And I think what an archive does is that it makes available uh, what has happened in the past, the experience that have been made, the failures, not only the successes, and sometimes I think the failures are even more important to learn from, and to bring them uh, into the present to discuss and on the basis of uh, this archival material and the experiences embedded and the historical knowledge embedded, then um, use it to develop uh, strategies for going on, working, doing things for the future. I actually also like a lot of what you said about this idea of people having the space to write themselves into history. And, and this idea mm -hmm. of in inclusivity, of being able to see and, and follow all the different stories that are happening simultaneously, all the different ways of doing it. And I think for so long, the idea of an archive or even a library was really knowledge held by and created by certain people somehow, you know, like mm -hmm. a very small group of people who also controlled the idea of literacy and access to that. And so with all that you're talking about, this inclusivity and the access to that, the access mm -hmm. to understand and to see that blueprint, what other people are doing, and to feel that you have a place in the history that's being written is, yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense, actually. It is, as you said, it's a place you have to give yourself or you have to, you have to claim, you know, or reclaim. And in doing that, uh, digital technology plays an incredibly important role because it, uh, it empowers a lot of people yeah. to do exactly that themselves that place. But let's keep it there. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's a very I have another topic. question where this person's asking, I like the idea of platforming of the park and the interweaving of online and analog meeting spaces. What characteristics define an online hybrid platform that's successful in creating a community? So which of those characteristics do you see? Okay, that's actually efficient for creating that infrastructure for that. Yeah, this sounds a little bit like a recipe book. I don't have this ready. <laughs> I don't have a recipe book for building a successful, <laughs> successful uh, hybrid uh, projects. Maybe um, the person who asked um, should should go to visit uh, further fields is always worth going there. It's amazing what's going on there. It's such it's totally unbelievable. You go, if you go there at the weekend when the gallery is open and when thousands of people are around. So but I think what is important is I mean I try to to to, to extract a little bit what, what what makes these projects. I think it's both I mean in further field it's a specific situation in the park and kind of this random audience they get through the park, you know. People like to go in the park and they happen to 
also visit the gallery just because it's in the middle of the park. They would not go elsewhere to visit the gallery. And this uh, this is amazing because it brings people to an art space which they wouldn't go there usually. And this also confronts uh, the art space with certain questions. You know, who whom who am who are we working for? Who 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 is our target group? Who are we interested in working for? You know, who do we want to show our um, art to? Is it just already the people who know about art who are already part of the canon, or do we? You know, do we have, are we ambitious enough to, to try out to open up this circle and do something that can also be relevant to other people? And um, I think for me, talking about, you know, successful re recipes, I think that's what I said in the end, thinking about this project, I think what very much, what is really important is that they all, from the beginning on, they have a very sometimes not explicit but very clear set of values it's obvious what they are about it's obvious what they want to achieve you know it's about something that you can understand and either you like it and identify with it or you say nonsense i have nothing to do with you know hacking gender <laughs> or whatever <laughs> but i think that's the that's the most imp that's the first thing you know that it must be about something which right. is which is relevant, which can be relevant to people, where people can identify with. And I think what helps a lot, I'm not actually, I still have to think about it, what that means that the people who run these projects are, are so important, because to be honest, they are, they are important, even if it's collective, if it's several people, you know, it has something to do with uh, with the credibility, with an embodiment also of values, is that it's not that you know can, you can write a lot of values on your website and blah blah blah, but what does it mean? I think it it only because it only gets a meaning when it's being translated into into the practice of of people you can identify with you or, or identify in the first place, you know. And those values are kind of trickling down through the actual actions that are being taken. So there's like yeah, this set of values that are existing, yes. but it's not just talking theoretically, academically. It's like, okay, now you understand through yeah. action, this is what's happening. Yeah. yeah, and if people do that and they are faithful to their set of values, even if it's developing, of course, with, uh, with the world around us, I think that makes a community very strong, you know, because you know, you know, if I'm dealing with Furlerfield, I know who I'm dealing with, you know. So I think that makes a part of the, of the, the, the attraction or the, the value of these uh, communities and the actually, success, yeah. if you like. No, it also <laughs> means it's really chief actually in general, just remaining faithful to a set of values, like for a community, for an individual. Yeah, this is, it works. Right? Um, the next question I have are, what are some findings of Balthazar's laboratory in terms of gender and technology? Which issues are there and how can we solve them? Mm -hmm. So I am not Ms. Batasas, so um, also for the person, if you're in Vienna, just go there, talk to them, <laughs> they appreciate it. <laughs> it's a bit difficult for me to talk, uh, to talk, to speak for them, you yeah. know. I can just uh, speak uh, generally because this is a field I have also been involved for a very long time and I think the, 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 the I mean, it's a complex field because it's, Technology also, it starts with well, how do we define technology? Where does it start? You know, that's the first thing. Um, the next question is, you know, what is gender? Where do you, you know, how do you define gender? Is, yeah. it, is it something to do with the body or with the social gender or blah, blah, blah. So it's a huge, a massive field. Um, but I think two basic um, assumptions of techno-feminism are really useful. The first states technology is never neutral. I think this is also something that uh, the director of the festival stated in yeah. the beginning, which I'm yeah. very grateful for. Yeah. <laughs> so technology is never neutral. And uh, the second is that technology is a highly gendered field. And of course, you can read this, you can look at this on many different levels. It starts in the very, on the very most basic level you know if something is 
broken with your technology, who do you go to ask for help? You know, who will help you? Who develops uh, technology? Who owns tech companies? And so on and so forth. So it's on many different levels. And um, I find the, the work of the, the British sociologist Judy Weitzman, she actually wrote a book that is called Technofeminism. It's already from 2004, but it's an enormously uh, relevant what she wrote and it's still the, the interesting thing is also we started Old Boys Network in 1997 which is 24 years ago we were dealing with ten, gender technology questions and, and now I'm I'm working with the next generation you know and they of course some things have changed but others did not at all you know so it there is a certain persistence in associating technology with manliness you know with the male so that it's still very difficult for people who identify as women or as female to seriously engage with this because it would automatically connotate them as not female but male yeah. you know not feminine but masculine yeah. and this is still going on with very young uh, girls and very young women. So this is so persistent and, and Judy Weizmann already started to describe this in the book and you know that the 19th century the white male engineer is like the embodiment of manliness you know how can you I mean yes. how can you deconstruct <laughs> this? this is very very difficult you know and also not I mean we can criticize this but the thing that I find uh, constantly is that it's so also deep embedded in myself you know so there's a constant process of unlearning myself when i have a technical pro problem that just say, oh, who can help me you know is there some guy around who can help me but say hey come on you know are you yeah. serious yeah. <laughs> you know? like, you've gone this you far can't yeah. solve it <laughs> That's true. No, but of course, it's, it starts from the very practical daily issues to a very uh, complex uh, discourse on, you know, also how gender is a technology that can, of course, be manipulated and used and uh, designed and engineered. Yeah. <laughs> That's all the time that we have for today. Um, thank you very, very oh. much for your time. Thank you very much for answering Thank you all the for questions. having me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having taken the time to really go into, yeah, go into these questions, go into these thoughts, even the way that you answer every question, really, yeah, thinking about it. That's the first thing, not just shooting off and being like, I know everything, but part of that understanding this and this intelligence of like, what is it that we need? What do other platforms provide? What does this provide? What can these people say? And that is, yeah, I guess that's the basis of community in a lot of ways is that connection is highlighting those other places and saying, okay, maybe I don't have this, but this place has that information and these people can do that. So I really, I appreciate you actually bringing that to our attention and being here with us today, yeah, even virtually. My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Check out the projects. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. And we will, or you'll see me back again in a little bit. Until then, enjoy some of the other things that are happening. And yeah, hope to see you soon. Yeah.